So let me start by, by thanking actually Fintar for uh, his support for the um, uh, 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 writing of this book. Uh, it came out actually of having invited in turn to, uh, to deliver the uh, 2011 annual wider lecture, uh, which I did in New York actually. And, uh, uh, and then he asked me to, to turn this to, into a book. So it, the result of a, of a low experience. I think the, let me start by uh, underscoring two features uh, of this book. Uh, the first one is that it's written by uh, an economist from the developing world. Uh, I think so the, the issues of the developing countries are, <clears throat> in a sense, all throughout the book, uh, which is, um, it's a significant difference with other books on the international monetary system, which generally ignore or on, you know, underestimate the reaches of the developing countries. <clears throat> the second is that uh, I finally uh, decided to use this term non-system, uh, which is actually not my invention. Uh, it was a term that was uh, uh, very commonly used in the 1970s uh, after the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system uh, and the, the resulting uh, non-system, they say, that uh, evolved out of that. Uh, because the negotiations that took place in the Committee of 20 from 1972 to 1974 uh, to actually design an alternative to Bretton Woods were, were total failure. Uh, so the, what happened were you know, ad hoc solutions. I mean, the most notable is the exchange rate system or non-system. Uh, because the, the idea was to uh, reestablish some parity uh, exchange rates uh, and, and, and there were, you know, a couple of attempts at doing that, uh, but in March 1973, the Europeans just told the U.S. that there was no hope of that, uh, that, the, that the exchange rates have to float. So the floating of the exchange rate of major currencies was not a desired solution. It was a, a de facto solution, uh, or non-solution, let's say. Uh, and, and then later on, uh, of course, the French, for example, wanted to give a role to the, to the gold. Uh, and there was a, a, you know, you know, hidden negotiations about that, about the role of the special Roman rights, uh, which also failed. So let me start with the, uh, uh, the main messages of, of, of the book. Uh, and, um, uh, and, um, uh, and then I'll give the floor to the, to the panelists. So uh, on the global reserve system, uh, the, the, the book basically uh, you know, argues for a system that has to be both stable and fair, uh, fair with, particularly with developing countries. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and it proposes basically uh, you know, a multi-currency system, uh, but with a much stronger role for the special drawing rights of the IMF, uh, which uh, are going to turn 50 next year, uh, but have been largely underutilized. Uh, in, in the current system. And it particularly argues for, for a, a, a special drawing rights uh, being used more actively, actually, as the major source uh, of financing of IMF programs, uh, uh, which, in a sense, is turning, them, turning the IMF into a small, uh, partial uh, world central bank, uh, which issue, issues its own currency, and its currency used like all central banks do, uh, I am a central banker now, <laughs> so, okay. uh, so I uh, do it basically to lend. You create money to lend or by lending, let's say. And uh, so the, the, uh, this is exactly the, uh, the proposal that uh, the, the way I propose it is that the SDRs uh, are issued regularly uh, and those that are not used by countries uh, will be considered deposits in the IMF, which the IMF then can lend uh, to countries. So that's basically the, uh, the proposal in that regard. Now, on, excuse me, on macroeconomic cooperation, uh, the, there are a, you know, a lot of um, uh, um, ideas about that. Uh, the first one is to actually more actively use the IMF rather than the G20, uh, as the, uh, basically because the, um, you can have a limited dialogue at, uh, of the major countries, but uh, within the IMF that are responsible to the whole membership rather than what happens today is that most negotiations take place totally outside the, the IMF. Um, uh, but the second one, uh, you know, the second set of uh, uh, ideas relate to, uh, to the exchange rate system, which af after all, 
uh, is the uh, major mechanism uh, that the uh, international, uh, uh, the world economy has to try to rebalance uh, uh, the uh, imbalances in, in, the, in the balance of payments, which is a recurring problem, as I argue in the book. So, you know, every time you more or less solve one uh, a global imbalance, there are new ones that come into being, and there are no mechanisms to, uh, let's say, to correct those imbalances. And sometimes the exchange rate movements go against that, against the, uh, and therefore, uh, I, I go back to the proposals, again, a proposal that in some cases uh, uh, were developed in the 1970s of using some system of reference rates uh, so that, uh, or, or reference bands. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, actually one of the advantages of, of a system such as that is first of all that there could be less volatility of the major currencies. I think the volatility of the euro and the dollar exchange rate, which is the major uh, dual exchange rate in the world, uh, is, uh, is a source of a lot of uncertainty uh, for uh, all parties in the international community, including developing countries, which then have to manage that in, uh, in a volatility. Uh, but also uh, because it would give a, a very clear definition uh, of what manipulating the exchange rate means, uh, which is basically to, to move the exchange rate in the opposite direction uh, to what you know, the reference uh, rate uh, uh, would look like. Now, in relation to, excuse me, in relation to, uh, to crisis uh, uh, prevention and resolution, uh, I basically uh, have a whole chapter on the issue of regulating cross-border capital flows uh, as, a, as a major topic um, and a, a, a topic which there has been a lot of discussion. Uh, and uh, as we have seen, to, uh, I was seeing today, again, the volatility of uh, financing for emerging and developing countries is a major source uh, on macroeconomic uncertainty. Uh, therefore, you know, uh, th this regulation should be uh, considered part of a financial regulation in general. It's, uh, it's quite uh, peculiar that the G20, through the Financial Stability Board, uh, has promoted uh, a stronger prudential regulation, but has totally ignored uh, cross-border capital flows as a source of, of, uh, a, of a uncertainty in, uh, in finance. Um, and therefore, you know, th this should be a major topic on, on how to do that, a, a major topic analysis. The second is, uh, is to have larger emergency financing. Um, uh, and, but particularly, I argue repeatedly in the book uh, for unconventional, uh, you know, un uh, unconditional automatic facilities of some sort. Uh, uh, in a sense, I, I, I show that the the swap credit lines of the Fed, for example, which is the major mechanism of financing among developed country central banks, which is a totally automatic, uh, um, unconditional facility, it should actually be a model to which uh, the IMF should approach some of its credit lines. I mean, the only one that looks a little like that is the flexible credit line, uh, but you know, it has only been used by two countries uh, now, uh, Mexico and my country, Colombia, which uh, uh, does use it. Uh, and it's actually, you know, it could be even more uh, uh, automatic in terms of, uh, of the approval uh, uh, line. So, and, and the other is, and the other is the need for, for a, an international debt workout mechanism, uh, a formal uh, mechanism of a sort, uh, going be beyond the market mechanism that had been uh, uh, developed, let's say, on a broader scale in the last decades, including in particular in recent times, uh, after the uh, problems of Argentina uh, in, uh, in U.S. Uh, or in New York courts uh, with this debt restructuring uh, that happened in 2014. Um, and finally, uh, I have three lines of uh, uh, proposals on improved governance of the system. The first is the traditional issue of the voice and representation of developing countries in the IMF, uh, uh, which is a, a topic that uh, uh, is again in the agenda. Uh, there was the, the last reforms in uh, 2010, uh, which took place actually six years to, uh, to be implemented because of U.S. Congress. Uh, but the, uh, you know, this is, a, again, the topic that is back in the agenda. The second is a more representative, uh, a, a, what I call APEX institution. Uh, a, I call it basically the G20, uh, the APEX institution. Uh, and I, I would say, the, you know, the Global Coordination Council, for example, that was proposed uh, in the Stiglitz Commission uh, in 2009, uh, 
uh, is probably the model, uh, but you could actually think of, of trying to uh, use the G20 uh, um, uh, as, the, as the mechanism, so long as uh, the, the G20 uh, represents all countries of the world uh, through some sort of, of weighted vote of some, of some type. I mean, uh, a country like mine, which is not a member of the G20, of, obviously would never recognize the legitimacy of the G20 uh, because it's not a representative institution. Uh, so the, the question is how to reform the, uh, the institution to have a, a representative G20. And finally, uh, I, I propose what I call a multi-layer architecture. Uh, I, uh, in my view, the, one of the major problems of the, of the monetary, international monetary system, uh, in contrast to the system of multilateral development banks, is that it has a, a lot of uh, holes in, uh, in, uh, in the international uh, arrangements. Uh, the multilateral development bank system uh, has, aside from the World Bank, it has a network of regional development banks, including the European Investment Bank, which is the largest of all. Uh, but uh, it has sub-regional banks in several parts of the world, for example, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, but it also has inter-regional banks, uh, the Islamic Development Bank being the most important, but now the, uh, the New Development Bank or the BRICS. And, and even uh, I can see the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank uh, wants to become also an inter-regional bank. Uh, so th that structure is dense, and the density uh, uh, is good for, for two purposes. Uh, the first one is to provide competition, uh, which is good for countries. And, and the second one uh, is to provide a stronger voice to small countries, uh, which is something that you, you don't have uh, when you have just a world institution in which all the small countries have a, a, a very weak voice. Uh, therefore, the, uh, uh, I think trying to re you know, construct more regional networks of different character, regional funds, sub-regional institutions, inter-regional institutions uh, in uh, supporting the uh, international monetary stability uh, is the, the third element of my reform proposal. Okay, with this, uh, let me give the, uh, the floor. Uh, uh, okay, and of course, this is the book. If it... <laughs> anyway. This doesn't seem to be working. <laughs> hey, okay, this is the book actually, and, and one of the very good things that uh, Wider has done is to have th these books open access. <laughs> <laughs> so you can all download the book. Uh, it's actually really a, a great, great idea in terms of dis dissemination. Okay, with this, let me give the floor first to Joe.